So what is imagination? When people use the term imagination, they usually have two meanings in mind. And the first one they think of is creativity. And this is the kind of thing that you mean when you say things like, uh, Julie Taymor has a great imagination, or when somebody says, I have no imagination. The other sense of imagination is picturing things in your head. And uh, this happens all the time. This happens when you plan, when you think about the future, when you reason hypothetically, when you think about the past or how the past might have been, when you design, when you fantasize, and when you think about, uh, or when you dream when you're sleeping, and when you daydream when you're awake, which, by the way, we spend about 20% of our time doing. In other words, imagination is incredibly important. And in fact, we've even found that if you imagine doing sports, it actually makes you better at doing the actual sport. Well, my goal in life is to understand imagination. I want to get under the hood and figure out how it works. When you read a book or someone asks you to imagine something, and that picture in your head, where does it come from? How do you decide what goes in that picture? And where do those things go? So that's what I'm going to try to do. So when I became a professor, I started the Science of Imagination Laboratory. And according to our theory, imagination is constrained by three different things. The first thing is the environment that you're in when you're called upon to use your imagination. Now, this might be the book that you're reading or when I tell you to imagine a, a dog or something. And the second thing is what we understand about the world, the rules that we understand of how the world works. We'll call that a world model. And then finally, our visual memory. And that is everything that we've ever seen, right? So um, I'm going to talk about how you can study imagination and uh, how it's been studied scientifically. And I'm particularly going to think about how our perceptual history affects our imagination. So, I want to understand imagination. Well, this might seem a little strange, right? Imagination and science, they don't seem to fit. Imagination seems to be one of the most elusive and mysterious things that there is, impenetrable to scientific investigation. Well, I'm going to talk to you about some ways that you can study imagination scientifically, how other people have done it, how I've done it, and what the future is going to hold for science of imagination. So one thing that you can ask people to do is to draw what they imagine. All right? Now, all these things have problems with them, but you try to do all of them and see if their results converge. And when you ask people to imagine shapes, for example, they imagine them with a flat side down. This is something we've done in our lab. And we hypothesize that this is because there's stability in the real world. Now, you might be thinking, well, maybe it's because you see shapes with a flat side down uh, all around you. And I think there's truth to this, too. But I think there's an interesting question. Why is it that things in the real world have a flat side down and in your imagination? And I think it's for the same reason, that there's stability in a world that has gravity. Now, over at McGill, Gosselin and Shins did this really cool experiment where they looked right into the imaginations of people. Here's what they did. They showed people white noise, just random dot patterns, and they told them that some of these things were going to have the letter S in them, and some of them weren't. And they were supposed to indicate whether or not they saw the letter S, OK? Now, 20,000 images, this took a long time. <laughs> but by averaging the ones they said yes to, because if you look hard enough, you'll see, a, uh, we call that top-down processing. If you average the ones they said yes to, you get this ghostly image of the S that they thought that they saw. And in fact, each person had a different font to it. So this is the, this is the result of one person's uh, results here. So this, this is great, look at this. This is the most direct view into someone's imagination that I've ever seen. There's another field that contributes a lot to this, and that's called the embodied cognition field. And the embodied cognition field shows us things like we imagine good motion to be left to right in our visual field. That's actually in our culture. In cultures where people write in the other direction, it's, it's the opposite. And you'll notice when you watch the Matrix movies, every time Neo gets into a fight, he's running left to right, and his enemy is running at him from right to left on the screen. They've also found that good motion is up and bad motion is down, and this gets reflected in our language when we say things are looking up, or she's really on top of things, or the depression is in a downward spiral. Okay? These are, uh, we've also associated verbs with directions. You show people choices like this, they're remarkably consistent in which ones they will associate with certain verbs. Respect is up, giving is left to right, destruction is down. How does this affect our imagination? Well, if I ask you to imagine somebody giving something, you're more likely to imagine the gift moving from left to right in your mind's eye. 
So we do these psychological kinds of experiments in my lab, but we're also trying to replicate human imagination on computers. We're trying to get computers to imagine the same way that the average person would. Okay, well, how does this work? One thing you can do, people can imagine things of different sizes. That's no problem. So if I ask you to imagine a tiny Cheshire cat, you have no problem doing that, even though you've probably never seen anything in your life that's been labeled as a tiny Cheshire cat. Well, one of the students from my lab, Jonathan Gagne, created a program called Visuo, and what it can do is it can imagine things of different sizes, heights, anything that can be described with a number. So if you ask it to imagine a tree, it can do that. And if you ask it to imagine a long tree, it can do that too, even if it's never seen anything that's been labeled as a long tree. Here's how it works. Let's imagine you've seen a bunch of crows in your life. Okay? Now, according to Visuo's theory, every different size of crow you've ever seen gets put into a distribution. Okay? A distribution with all the different sizes of crows that you've ever seen. All right. Now, some of these crows are going to be labeled as large. All right? Well, those large crows, they contribute to all crows, but they also go into a special distribution for large crows, and likewise for the small ones. Now let's imagine that you've seen some ravens, but you've never seen ravens that were labeled as large. So the ravens contribute to the all ravens distribution over here. Now, you've also seen buildings and ocelots and improv groups. So you're called upon to imagine a large raven. Well, according to our theory, what happens is you look for the most related thing in memory to raven. In this case, it would be crows and not buildings or ocelots. We'll get rid of those. And then you look at how to transform the distribution of all crows into the distribution of large crows. So we have this mathematical transformation. And we apply that same transformation to ravens. What we end up with is an imagined distribution of what large ravens might look like. And from that, you can imagine a single large raven. So here we have a uh, system that can imagine new sizes of things it's never seen before. It's a step toward computer creativity and imagination and perhaps understanding it in humans as well. So if we want to replicate human imagination, we need a database of everything everybody's ever seen. But we don't have that, okay? But we do have a proxy for that. We've got images from the web that are labeled with different regions, all right? So there's a database that I've got from a game called Peekaboom, and what it has is labeled regions for different parts of images. So here we have a puppy. We know there's a puppy there. But this database also has uh, information about where the eyes are, where the nose is, where the tail is, that kind of thing. So it can figure out that noses tend to be below the eyes, and the mouth tends to be below the nose, without us having to tell the computer that explicitly, which is a huge job, believe me. So we've got this uh, d database that shows us what things tend to appear in images together and where they are. That's very powerful. So we can create a um, an imagination model that can do the imagining for us. So if you imagine, ask it to imagine a bird above a house or something like that, it can imagine the bird in the house, but it can also know what else should be there, a sky, a ground, whatever, and where in the image it should be. So here's what we do. We mine this database and try to find all the co-occurrences. What kinds of things tend to go together in images? Because that's very important for imagination. And another one of my students, Cesar Estudio, is working on a, he made a program called the uh, Image Oracle. And what you can do is you can type in a word, and it'll tell you what else is going to be in the image. So if you type in computer, this is what you get. There's a 28% chance there's a screen in the image, and 18% uh, chance there's a window, et cetera. So this is, this is good. And it'll also tell you where it is, because we look at the angles and uh, distances between them. So let's just say that you ask our whole system to imagine a big tree. The Visuo program can tell you how big that tree is supposed to be, and then the Image Oracle can tell you what else is supposed to be in the image with the tree and where it is. And we can figure out all the sizes for that, too. So we're on our way to having computers create brand new two-dimensional images that nobody's ever seen before based on a little tiny user input. All right? And then we're going to do it in 3D, but you know, we haven't gotten there yet. Now, one of the things this is applicable to is computer vision. And this is trying to get computers to understand scenes and pictures and videos and this kind of thing. And one kind is object recognition, which is understanding uh, the objects that are in scenes. And this is good for everything from driving all the way to understanding medical images. Now, if I ask you what's hidden here, you can probably know it's a monitor based on the context. Even if I told you it looked like a sky, you'd probably think, well, it's prob maybe it's a sky on a monitor. And you'd be right. But computer uh, object recognition systems don't have that kind of wisdom that you do about what things tend to co-occur. The way object recognition systems work is they take an image and they run a window over it and they look for everything that they can recognize and they say, ah, yeah, here's this, here's that. So here, uh, no face, no face, no face. Face. Okay, good, there's a face. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't use what it's found before 
to constrain what it finds in the future. So it, wouldn't, it would do very badly at that, um, that uh, problem I just gave you right there, because it doesn't have the context. So what we can do is we can make this imagination system help the uh, object recognizer make better guesses. So when the uh, object recognition says, hey, it's a sky, our system says, you know what, there's a less than 1% chance there's actually a sky, there's a 28% chance it's a computer screen. Maybe it's a sky on a computer screen or something like that. Another thing we've been doing is we've been teaching computers what the meaning of English spatial relationships are, like close to and next to and above and this kind of thing. And a student of mine, uh, Connor Smith, has been heading this project. And what we've been able to do is get the, you could type in something like uh, cat below a tree and that's what it returns. And there's hand occluding a book and a spoon close to a fork. These are actual images returned based on its understanding. So. When I say this kind of thing, people are like, oh, this isn't imagination, you know, a cat in a tree, you know, well, it's easy, right? But this is, the people are getting back to the first definition of imagination I mentioned, which is the creativity. But I just want you to think about the things you've seen that are really imaginative. They all have a very firm basis in reality. Even the most imaginative worlds you've ever seen in movies or whatever, they've got some kind of physics, they've got characters that act basically like people, right? And usually they tweak reality in very specific ways to make a, an interesting or entertaining world. What this means is, for us to get computers to come up with really creative, really imaginative kinds of things, you need a very firm understanding of the way the real world actually works. It takes a good understanding of reality to make compelling fantasy. The other thing that people often say to me is like, well, I'm interested in why, why is it that I imagine something one way and somebody else imagines it another way? In psychology, they call that individual differences. And day to day, we're all obsessed with that. Why am, how am I different from this person? And yes, when you, you know, you're being really creative, you get differences, but people take for granted the vast amount of similarity that we actually have. If I told you I made oatmeal in my kitchen this morning and you picture that, most of you are gonna imagine a ground and a sink and a fridge. It's only when we're called upon to be very creative do we come up with very uh, different kinds of things. Like if I asked you to imagine an alien kitchen, for example. So again, you need to understand uh, the basics of how everybody acts before you can get to the individual differences. So in conclusion, Imagination is all around us, it's, it's, it's a fascinating subject, and by automating it, we're going to be able to make uh, computers that can create intuitive visualizations, uh, designs for, uh, that'll, that are good for education, and maybe even someday they'll be able to create entire movies for us. If you get me back for a TED Talk in 20 years, I'll let you know how the progress on that's going. <laughs> um, and in the meantime, uh, we'll, uh, we're working on this, and what are these future computer systems going to show us? At this point, we can only imagine. Thank you. Thank you.